Good afternoon, children of God. Wherever you are, we are happy that you're able to enjoy Bible study that we will do through reviewing the lesson that we have spent time on on a weekly basis titled How to Interpret the Scriptures. Before we start, I'll ask Brenda to pray with us. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Master, thank you for your grace that continues being sufficient for us. Thank you, dear Lord, for your love, your care, and your mercy. Thank you, dear Father, for even bringing us to your Sabbath worship. Lord, I pray that even as we take time to go through what we have studied this quarter, that you may open our hearts and our minds, fill us with the Holy Spirit, O Lord, and give us understanding. Father, we pray that everything we learn here may it find a place to grow in our hearts. We put everyone and all the viewers into your hands, O Lord, and we pray for a double portion of your blessings. Lead us, O Lord, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, viewers, we are going to cover 13 segments in our study today. 13 being, one would be what was covered in one week, but clearly we cannot cover the entire study for the week or for the three months in one hour or so. So we will focus on some key aspects that we picked out in that lesson. And I pray that we will all be blessed as we do this. So, interpreting the Word of God. In order to interpret the Word of God, number one, we would want to consider the uniqueness, the uniqueness of the Bible. Assuming you are talking to someone who has never read the Bible and you met them and they asked you, so what makes you so happy every day? What is it about you that energizes you no matter what your circumstances? How, how, Esther, would you talk to such a person about the uniqueness of the Bible. What is it about the Bible that keeps you going to the Bible every day? What keeps me going to the Bible every day actually is the theme of the Bible. The fact that the Bible is a love story from God, our loving Father, Father who loves us beyond comprehension and documents his ever stretching of his hands to mankind, sinful human beings like us, his mercy, his comfort, his uh, correction, advice, instructions for us so that one day when, when, when he comes, we can go with him to heaven. The Bible is unique because it's, it's written over a long period of time, longer than most books, 1,500 1, years in different continents, Europe, Asia, Africa. Uh, the fact that this book is an amalgamation of 66 different books and with 40, over 40 authors makes this book a very special book. But its content endears it to me more than the fact that it's even the first book that is ever printed, uh, a known book that was uh, printed. All those uh, are important things, but most, is, uh, most important thing, Sister Florence, is the fact that the Bible tells us about God's love and mercy towards us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. To a person that is considering the Word of God and has read up on what different Bible scholars have to say about the, the Word of God. It is possible to come across divergent views. And unfortunately, we have Bible scholars who are skeptical about certain portions of the Word of God. Jack, yes. I don't know whether you could share with us some of those glaring criticisms or skepticism 
that have been documented concerning the Word of God. Some of the challenging areas, I want to call them challenging areas for some of us to understand, uh, include uh, some teachings like the story of the creation, the story of the flood, the existence of original men and women, or man and woman, Adam and Eve, stories about the prophet Daniel, uh, stories about the children of Israel, the miracles of Christ, uh, and such like issues. Uh, th these are things that may not be understood using human wisdom, and it's important for us to approach the Bible from a position of faith. When uh, Paul writes, in most of his writings, he talks about us dealing with God based on our faith in him, and understanding what he wants from us as a prerequisite for us gaining the promises or benefiting from what he has promised us in the future. In uh, Hebrews 11.1, 1, we read about faith being the substance of things that we hope for. That means when we interact, you know, the Bible is a process of revelation, God revealing himself to man. In, during the, the creation, he came in person. He would come to the garden to talk to Adam. After that generation, he talked to them through prophets. Then during our times, he inspired the prophets and the disciples to write for us the Bible. So it is simply a process of us getting to understand and to interact with God and us reading about his promises. But we need to believe that these promises apply to us to put us in a position where we can claim them and enjoy the benefits. So without faith in God and without faith in his word and his messengers, then we will not be able to make sense of what is revealed to us in the Bible. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Paul in Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. For believers and non-believers, panelists, what does this really mean? Is it possible to be a follower of Christ and not have the ability to hear? What does it really mean? That faith comes by hearing. That hearing comes by the word of God. Anyone? Yeah. When Paul was writing, Paul was uh, trying to talk to the New Testament Christians about mm. Christ and his ministry. And uh, he was simply telling them that now, if, if you may not accept what I am telling you, then compare what was written before with what I am telling you. And that is why he tells them, build your faith based on what you hear, and, and you know what, by Paul's time, most of what we call the New Testament had not been written. What we had was really the Old Testament. So Paul quotes from Isaiah and all those other prophets. So he tells them, believe because it was written in what you people call scripture, which was the Old Testament. So we have, we have enough ground because as, as, as my co-panelist was saying, the Bible was written over a span of 1,500 years by very many different authors, about 45 different authors. It is a composition of 66 books. So it is not, and, and all of it points to Christ and his ministry at the cross and salvation for mankind. So there is no disharmony in any of these books. So if a message is consistent from year one to year 1000, you know, in, in our lives we change a lot. The person I am at 25 was not the person I was at eight. We change. But the Bible is consistent from Genesis to Revelation. So we approach it with faith, we approach it with belief, and then we get the benefits that are promised to us in this world. Thank you for giving us the context of the scripture that we have just digested. Brenda, just picking up on what Jack is saying. In a postmodern age, with all our advanced knowledge, People can be influenced greatly by Satan's deceptions, which are normally very subtle. 
very, very subtle, but persuasive nonetheless. How would us as Christians insulate ourselves from the deceptions of Satan in the context of our modern world so that we remain true to this word of God that has stood the test of time? How could we do that? Thank you so much. And even as I get to um, answering that section, I'd still invite those who are watching to leave their comments and uh, their views so that we can interact together, even if we are far and wide. Now, coming to the point of discussion and thinking about the postmodern world, there is something that has come out clearly from what we have discussed thus far. The Bible is very consistent. You can imagine a book that has been written over a span of 1,500 years. That is a lot of people, a lot of generations. That is a lot of different things. But one thing about the Bible is that it is very, very consistent. Now, when we are looking at where we are today, you see, the devil takes advantage of the various changes that are happening the various things that come along in our lives. He takes advantage of the situation to try and confuse us, to try and um, put in some error, add some different points of view so that we may stray away from the kingdom of heaven. Um, one approach that has worked all through the Bible and even with Jesus Christ himself, he adopted an it is written approach. Yeah, Anything that uh, the devil would send our way. And you know, the devil also knows this scripture. He knows it. So he's able to use the scripture to his advantage. He's able to twist it as he did during the temptation of Christ. He quoted scripture, but he quoted it out of context and tried to persuade Christ to bow down and worship him. Even today, as we are going on with our lives, there are different things that happen. And sometimes things don't seem to appear so clear because the devil has used very, his, his ways are very, he, he just takes one point and twists, twists it a bit so that we may get confused and we may get lost in everything that is happening. But how we insulate ourselves, how we protect ourselves is, a, is having the approach that Jesus Christ had. It is written. And how will we know what is written? When we ourselves take time to study that which is written study and pray so that God may be able to show us the way that we may walk in it. In so doing, we will be able to fight off the devil and we'll be able to keep ourselves from his evil hands as we prepare ourselves for the kingdom that is to come. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Maybe if I could add something to the points she has raised. Yes. One big temptation we face these days is uh, the notion that we live in the era of grace and uh, we equate grace with the New Testament, and uh, we equate the Old Testament with the law. So we say that after Calvary, now we don't need the law anymore. When, when, when Christ was talking, after Christ had risen, I'm, I'm, I'm at uh, Luke chapter 24, there's a story there from verse 13 all the way to verse, 50, verse 49. It is the story of Christ and how he meets two people, Cleopas and the friend on the road to a mouse, and he talks to them. The, the outstanding thing for me is that Christ reads from all scripture when he is explaining to them the issues around, because the, the talk of town was about the, the crucified master. And they didn't seem to understand what Jesus and his ministry was all about. So he reads to them from all scripture. If we can adopt a similar attitude where we value, we value all, all, all the writings of the Bible and give them their due prominence, then we, might, we will also avoid, by God's grace, to fall into the pitfalls of postmodern philosophies and other challenges of the, 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 the present day world. Thank you, Jack. So I hear you two saying that going by the example of Jesus, who faced with everyday life situations, reverts back to the Bible and he goes to the Old Testament. The apostles, I hear you saying, are doing the same 
thing. They're doing the same thing. Confirming to us that those who hand down the word of God, even in their days, they were skeptics. There were people who were questioning, including questioning the word of God himself when he said, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Mm -hmm. Let us take the example, viewers, of Jesus and the apostles. Believe the word of God and not fall into Satan's deceptions. Esther, the Bible is true. But there are certain aspects of life today, whether you are Caucasian, whether you are an African in the African content, continent, wherever we are, there are certain influences in our lives that can easily derail us from the centrality of Scripture in our day-to-day -day lives. For example, I suspect you are a Lu, by the way you speak, and obviously I am one also. The Luo community have very, very strong culture, and I believe many African tribes do the same. So are there, are there aspects of our culture that if we are not careful, could derail us from taking the Bible as the central part that should influence our decision making? And apart from culture, could there be other things that if not managed properly, could take away God's truth from being practiced in our lives. Thank you, Flora. I, I think that the fact that one is even alive and is participating in this thing called living, there are uh, a lot of noises around <laughs> human beings that um, can deter centrality of the gospel in one's life. And um, that comes with tradition and, and uh, culture, because culture is a way of life. And uh, therefore, the way that we live, even as laws, the, the way you say, mm -hmm. there are so many things that come into conflict with the laws and precepts of God, and therefore, we need to be careful as Christians. Whenever culture or tradition comes, uh, appears, and there are some traditions and cultures that actually uh, ha do not come into conflict, with the laws of God. Because you know, culture, dressing or what, uh, culture, language, culture is, is food. But there are certain things that come into direct conflict with uh, our lives as Christians. It, it did during Jesus' time. When uh, Jesus was living on earth, uh, Pharisees are asking, you are, uh, disciples are not washing their hands in some particular way. Mm. And, and Jesus has to to tell them, uh, to refer them back to the Bible and in context, because they added tradition to the law of God, traditions. And tradition has got a way of adding itself on top of another because you cannot annul it. It is a habit that is formed as time goes on. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Pharisees say, uh, for example, that uh, on Sabbath day, the longest you can walk is a meter. And, and because they find themselves in conflict with their own law and tradition that they have brought and added on God's law, they add another tradition to make it safe for them. And that, say if you left your food in somebody's yes, house, you yeah. can walk for longer than a meter to get your food. Then you can get your food on Sabbath day. Or food you can go and get. Yes. So you, you wonder, is that law? Are they obeying God's law? Did God actually bring it or not? So such things happens to human beings, like you have said, whether you are white or black or any color, because you live. There are cultures that, uh, and practices and traditions that can influence um, uh, your practice as a Christian. I hear uh, you, Esther. Thank you. On experience, because I believe our experiences mm -hmm. can actually influence how we interact with the Bible. Yes. You can see viewers, um, I have an iPad 
And in this iPad, I have access to the entire world. And that is the experience of humanity now, wherever we are. There is so much information, Brenda. Anyone with a phone which has a camera and a microphone inbuilt can come online and tell you something about creation and quote scripture after scripture telling you about creation or about marriage in our world today they can even tell you the constitution in their land says this and this so how would you as a young person guide your friends on which source they should rely on for their theology, for an authoritative platform to say, fine, there is activism going on all over the world. And in the net, the truth is not the truth because it's in the word of God. The truth is what you make it. You will hear such things. So how do you tell young people who, has, who have access like us older ones and through our experience of the web now, there is so much information with talented people coming with persuasive positions and trying to explain away our foundations for belief. How? how what, what do you say about the experience of the internet vis-a-vis -vis theology? Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Like you've said, there are so many things around the world, so many teachings, so many differences, so many ideas. But where do we draw the line? That is the important question. Where do we, as human beings, draw the line? I would, I would advise someone who is uh, at that crossroad. Number one, think about what Jesus would do. Think about what Jesus would do. Faced with certain situations, if Jesus was in the situation you are in today, where would he be looking at? Which side would he be leaning on? And even as we are exposed to all this information, all these different cultures, all these different practices, let us think about what they do to our Christian work in that if someone saw us taking part in these cultures, if someone saw us being socialized in a particular way, if someone saw us interacting with people in a certain way, would they want to worship the God that you're worshiping? Would your actions, would your thoughts, would your speech lead your neighbor to want to know about the God you worship? Now, if God is in you and you actually worship God and you commune with him, God, God will live in you and whatever comes out of you will be influenced of God. So just think about your neighbor and think about um, whatever you're going through and ask yourself if, the person, if other people saw you in that particular way, would it uphold God? Would it hold the banner of God high or would it actually be showing other things that are not God related? So it is important that even as we are exposed to all these things, even as we interact with the various uh, cultures, different information and all the things that we are exposed to in the internet, let us learn to filter them, to get only that which is from God to influence our lives so that even us, we can still use these particular spaces to lead other people to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Brenda. Just in case you are lost a bit, we are reviewing the quarter's teachings on how to interpret scriptures. We are already on lesson number four and moving on to lesson number five, which we covered between April 25th and May the 1st. Jack. Yes. Lesson number five, and for our viewers online, for our regular members, these lessons can be obtained on the net and in any of our bookshops known as ABC bookshops. Lesson number five yes. is about by scripture alone. Mm. The memory text which came from Hebrews 4 verse 12 told us that for the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul 
and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a designer of thoughts and intents of the word. I hear the word of God saying, the word of God is enough. Mm. The word of God is enough. If it can penetrate soul and spirit, mm. it can penetrate joints and marrow. Mm. It can penetrate those silent thoughts that we have mm. Mm. and the intents of our hearts, motivation, the motives mm. around our thoughts mm. that the word of God can penetrate. So Jack, how is it? How is it that we read the same word of God, which is sharp mm. and reaching us to our very soul? Mm. How come? How come we still have erroneous beliefs that are held so strong? Mm -hmm. For example, for example, you hear of secret rapture. Secret rapture. Mm -hmm. where some believe that one day you'll just realize that Brenda is no longer with us. And it is because Brenda will have been taken up secretly to heaven. Mm -hmm. Are there those things that we know of that are clearly erroneous? Mm -hmm. And how would we, how would we avoid running with erroneous Beliefs. Because someone has read a scripture mm. that someone will be at the mill mm. and someone is taken. And Another is left. Mm. Is there any other supporting scripture that would tell us that this actually is what forms the basis mm. of that belief in the secret rapture and any other erroneous belief? This just borrows from what uh, Brenda was covering in lesson four. These different issues that inform, we have, we, we have made them inform our theology, our experiences, our feelings, our cultural predispositions and our traditions. It is, it is dangerous to ground ourselves on those elements because Jesus says in Matthew that heavens and earth will pass, but the word of God will remain forever. And so we should do, we should, inf we should base our interaction and our understanding of God on scripture alone. And as uh, Flora has rightfully said, Hebrews 4.12, she was reading from Hebrews 4.12. I summarize this verse as follows. God's word is powerful enough to the extent that it can expose us for who we really are. Our false notions, our insecurities, our unbelief, and our everything else, God's word has the power to lay that bare to us. The problem with us, because the word is incorruptible, and uh, it is, th th there's no segment of God's word that is useless. Uh, God's word comes to us in two ways. In John, with John chapter 1, we find God's word incarnate. Because John 1, 1 says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. 1, 14, the word was made flesh, dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, the glory as unto the Lamb. Then there's the word of God talked, spoken about in Second Peter. I think it's uh, chapter 2, verse 9 or something, which says, men did not write as of cunning fables, mm -hmm. but they were led by the Spirit. So God's word is complete in itself. It is alive. And it has the ability to, to guide us in the correct path. One of the th reasons why we have erroneous doctrine is because we highlight sections of scripture that we feel speak to us better than others. We love reading and, and forming our arguments and thoughts and life principles based on areas that we feel are advantageous to our circumstances. But Jesus in... Uh, Jesus, uh, in Paul rather, in 2 Timothy 3.16, in Titus uh, 1.9 and in 2 Timothy 1.13, talks about the totality of Scripture. Uh, I love 3.16, which uh, was read to us at the beginning of this lesson. It talks about all Scripture, the wholesome compilation. 
That is what becomes good, not a section of scripture, not the New Testament alone, not the Old Testament alone. Another thing is that scripture is very clear. There are no, there are no ambiguities in, in scripture. What is spoken about in Genesis, for example, where Jacob tells his son that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, comes to fruition in the New Testament where Matthew gives us the genealogy of Christ and we see how he comes from the house of Judah. So the last point should be that the Bible should be used as its own expositor. Again, let us not rely on our traditions, let us not rely on our feelings, let us not rely on our cultural practices as we try to explain what is written in the Bible. If we find something that is not make, does not seem to make sense to us at that particular time, then it is important for us to go back and study again. So that, study, read widely around the issue, around the topic at large, and uh, around supporting verses. So that we can avoid some of these erroneous teachings like the state of the dead, where we, we, we believe that now when someone is, these days we t say dance with the angels, and, and such funny things, they're not doctrinal really, because Ecclesiastes says the dead know nothing. And when, they, when people die, they are buried, and that's the end, and we wait for resurrection. So wide reading, and depending on the Holy Spirit, and allowing scripture to interpret itself, will really help us fight some of these erroneous teachings that are with us in our present day world. So, so we, we are saying, that we may refer to explanations that are trying to expound on the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And we have commentaries, we have books written mm -hmm. that help to explain the Word of God. Mm -hmm. We also have Bibles that they are, they are called um, illustration Bibles, mm -hmm. uh, where you find commentaries within the Bible. Mm -hmm. We would be saying that the Word of God which is unedited, that the man or the woman behind the illustrated Bible has commented on. If there's a comment within that Bible that is moving away from the truth that we know it. Mm -hmm. We shall stand by sola scriptura, scriptura. Mm -hmm. meaning we shall rely on the authority of the Bible alone to explain itself. Where there is a divergent of explanation away from the truth that mm -hmm. we know. For example, if you found a, a commentary saying the text that you have just illustrated, mm. in the beginning mm -hmm. was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with, with God. God. Mm -hmm. You will find someone saying, oh, but Jesus is not God. There are people who believe that, and they are Christians. Yeah. So we are saying, if you come across that kind of commentary, the Word of God will be telling you, mm -hmm. Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. Because the, it's plain truth. It's plain English. It doesn't require too much interpretation. True. We shall rely on the authority mm -hmm. of the inspired word of God. Sister Flora, because there are some uh, commentators or yes. Bible commentaries that are, are actually inspired. Yes. Not all people who are inspired wrote books mm -hmm. that were included into the uh, canons of the Bible. For example, John the Baptist, uh, a great man according to the Bible. The Bible calls him the greatest man born of a woman, paraphrase. Now, he didn't write any book, the Baptist, mm. and, and therefore inspiration, no books, comment, comment like uh, Sister Flora says, if they are inspired and they do not uh, put themselves to be superior to the Bible, or in the same league of the Bible, mm -hmm. then we can accept them. But we are, we are saying that reason, tradition, culture, and, and all these things, so long as they, are not, um, uh, they do not have in their essence 
the Bible as superior and having authority and to elevate the Bible, mm -hmm. then we, we, they, will, they can be erratic. That's why the Bible says, accept the Bible as a child. Look at the characteristic of a child. Jesus says so. Mm -hmm. You know, the child does not, in fact, the story of a child and the theme of a child, what makes a child is love. Mm -hmm. He meets another child, hi, how are you? He wants to be friends. And, and, and no complication, no mm -hmm. tension, the way you mm -hmm. young people say. Children, they don't have tension or complication, mm -hmm. and, and that is the spirit with which we should accept the Bible. Not, not that we are learned, not that we have gadgets that we can use to get information. Otherwise, we'll just be people who are intelligent and get maybe A in CRE or anything else if we do not uh, accept the Bible uh, the, with humility that the spirit brings with it. Thank you, Esther. An, Thank an, you, panelists. Yes, Jack, an, you want to add an, something? Another, another quick comment. We have also been tempted, and sometimes we fall into the, 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 the pitfall of uh, elevating some writings above mm -hmm. the Bible yes. so that we say, oh, so-and-so says this, mm -hmm. or oh, prophet so-and-so wrote this and that. It's a bit dangerous because uh, some of these inspired writers have put caveats and have made it very clear that you should have the Bible, you should make reference to the Bible at all times and hold it as a higher standard than whatever the rest of us write. And what we write should simply lead you to the Bible. But uh, sometimes we, we, we get into the temptation of focusing so much on what is extra biblical and forgetting what is really written in the Bible. So that is something we might also want to watch out for. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Clearly we are seeing that interpretation of the word of God is necessary. Peter, Peter, one of the apostles writing in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, mm. records in the Bible itself that some of the writings by Paul... Maybe I can read for you. Please read. Mm. And consider. Read it loudly so that we can. Sec Second Peter. Second chapter? Peter three, fifteen, 3, 15 and, 16, and sixteen. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction mm -hmm. as they do also the rest of the scriptures. Peter is saying salvation is real, it's factual. Mm -hmm. And Paul has written a lot about salvation. Mm -hmm. But in some of his writings, which Peter is acknowledging mm -hmm. is inspired by God. Mm -hmm. But inspired as they are, some of the writings are difficult to understand. So there is an admission right there that because we are human, because we have our limitations, because we have various authors inspired by the same spirit, the grace I have for interpretation today may be limited because of my limitation, it does not take away the truth that the word of God is hard. And I like the way Peter is saying, mm. through the wisdom given him by God, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Brenda, that Peter can have wisdom now that you're reading about now and you are challenged. So how... Do we then approach scripture? Do you give up when you find a piece of writing within the Bible that you read for the whole year? And you're looking at it and you're finding difficulty. Mm -hmm. You're reading Daniel, the book of Daniel, and you're coming across beasts and all manner of things. Oh, you're reading Jude. And Jude has, you know, very active, very active, but sometimes scary things. Mm -hmm. Do you give up on reading the word of God because it is hard? So what do you do? We are talking about how to interpret scripture. What do we do? 
Ah. Interestingly, you know, when you're studying the word of God, you'll come across different passages in scripture. Some are plain and simple and clear. Yeah. You will read the Ten Commandments and it says, thou shall not kill. And it's very clear, thou shall not kill. But you get to certain portions of scripture and they are a bit more challenging because of the content therein. Now, um, as you were even talking about uh, studying the book of Daniel or now comparing it to various parts of scripture and the levels of difficulty involved in the same, I thought about Martin Luther when he embarked on studying scripture. And Martin Luther, in his own words, said, to pray is the better half of Bible study. Um. Like he acknowledges that him with his own human strength opening the sacred pages, he might not be able to fully comprehend what God has put therein for him and for other people. So even before he approached the Bible and began to study it for himself, he took so much time in prayer. And for him, at the time he was doing this, it was a time when the Bible was not so widely circulated to people. So he, he, he first uh, took himself upon prayer so that he may be able to allow God to use him as he's studying his word. And even as we, we today are studying God's word, we will have the same challenges. We'll come across scripture that is very difficult and others that are plain and clear. When we, get, when we are taking time to study the Bible, we also need to take time in prayer. And why are we praying? We are praying because we need God to open our hearts and our minds. We need to ask God to teach us to approach his word with so much humility, with such an open heart, with such an open mind, so that we can allow ourselves to be influenced of him, like we are allowing God to speak to us through his word. When we allow God to speak to us through his word, we will be able to understand even these difficult portions of scripture. Now, why is it important to have the scripture interpreted? It's because like we said earlier, there are so many different things and so many divergent opinions and views that we would get outside here. But reading the Bible and why it is important to have the scripture interpreted is so that we do not miss the important message that God has in the Bible for each and every one of us. God speaks to us through his word. And his word may come in different and various ways. It is upon us to seek him that he, we may be able to interpret this scripture so that we may not miss what God wants us to get from him. And a very important thing about uh, the Bible is that to a very great extent, the Bible interprets itself. Mm -hmm. You cannot, um, God cannot give us his word and let us go round and round in circles without giving us an answer mm -hmm. to the same. Even when you're reading the difficult books, the ones that are termed difficult, like the books of prophecy, in the same same books, God explains what is meant by the various things that are difficult, yeah. and he allows his servants to learn of him. He allows his servants to um, understand the message therein. And that same grace that God gave his servants while they were writing the inspired word, God has given us that grace. And we also need to claim it. We need to pray and seek him so that even as we are studying scripture, we are encouraged by the message therein. We are able to interpret it so that it may change our lives and so that we may also use it to reach out to God's children. Thank you so much. Well, just to add something. Huh? Yep. Peter says in the text that we read mm -hmm. that people who misinterpret Paul's readings do so to their own destruction. destruction. So there's a danger already coming uh, coming being placed on the, the unfortunate event that we misinterpret scripture. That is why we need to have the correct interpretation of scripture. One of the things that may lead to false interpretation of scripture is having preconceived opinions or presupp presuppositions. Mm -hmm. We, most of us who interact with the Bible, come to read the Bible from a biased point of view. We have an opinion that we want to propagate. So we look for the Bible to support, or rather we read the Bible looking for texts that will support the that opinion we have. Opinions we hold. Those, those who are active users of social media have seen a clip doing, round, doing rounds a few days ago where a certain preacher appears to allude 
that Christ died for one race as opposed to another race. Mm -hmm. What he's saying in effect is he's, he's trying to speak to issues of social justice. But he is misusing the Bible in his quest to address issues of social justice. We don't have a problem with social justice as Christians, but let us do proper biblical interpretation. Because if we read and understand the Bible well, then it, issues of fairness and equality just come out uh, automatically. Another problem that may cause false interpretation is the issues of translation. Now languages vary. There are some languages which are richer than others. So you may find that when, for example, translating from Greek to English, there are Greek words which don't have a direct equivalent in English. So some interpreters, I'm using the word lazy very cautiously <laughs> and conservatively, may opt to misinterpret or, or they may fail to give it the proper representation, hence creating grounds against which we readers who are not familiar with the original language can misinterpret scripture. Another issue uh, has been the issue of culture. And uh, some people have stood and uh, spoken against certain doctrines because they do not fit into the cultural context where we live today. Lo and behold, the Bible transcends these cultural divisions. So we should read the Bible with an open mind and as you said, pray, 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 pray so that the Spirit of God will help us understand some of these things that we feel do not fit into our culture. And in real sense, when our eyes are opened, we find that everything written here is relevant to us. I hear you talking of opened eyes. Yes. As you're reading the Word of God. Mm. Meaning, not the opening of the morning when you wake up. Paul is the one who talks about may the eyes of your hearts be enlightened that mm. you may understand the depth and the height of the love of God. Ephesians chapter 1, I believe. Amen, amen. So we are saying that in order to get the correct interpretation, all that we have mentioned today is important. Mm. Approach it with humility. Mm -hmm. Drop your pride. Drop your preconceived ideas. And go humbly seeking the Holy Spirit to be your guide and your strength. Esther, I sense that we have actually covered the language context and the text of the Bible. So quickly, I would like us to go into Genesis as a foundation for our faith, the story of creation. Are there key things in the story of creation that are foundational to our faith, Jack. When, when we look at the book of Genesis chapter 1 to Genesis chapter 3, we find uh, the story of humanity and uh, rather the, the life of men and our interaction with God is summarized in these three chapters. Because in Genesis we'll find the stories of our origins, we were created. In Genesis we'll understand the concept of time, Day, literal days, because the world was created in six literal days. In Genesis, we will understand the teaching of the Sabbath, because on the seventh day, God rests and commands the entire humanity to adhere to that. In Genesis, we will find the teaching of marriage, because God feels that Adam is lonely and creates a helper for him. In Genesis, we also see the story of the fall of humanity, and uh, the plan of salvation being set in motion, where men go for uh, clothes of, uh, fab, make clothes from figs and leaves, but God kills a lamb in their place. So our, our faith as Christians is really anchored in the book of Genesis. Thank you, Jack. So we find marriage as an institution in the word of God. Yes. We find the Sabbath, we find fundamental truths of our faith mm. in that. Um, the Word of God is really, really wonderful. And uh, we would not be able to complete the entire quarter this time because of the interruptions that we have had. So to those that are watching us online on the video, when you will get it, we would like to come back and complete this quarter's lesson study, where we would look at 
biblical characters that are actually part of our history as we know it. David, mm. Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and others. Mm. We would also want to come back and cover a very critical subject, which is Bible and prophecy, mm. especially the prophecy indicated in Daniel 7 and 8. It has been a challenge to many people, but we would really love to come back at an appropriate time and complete this study of this quarter's lesson. It was full of treasure. Mm -hmm. It has been a treasure hunt in the last three months. Mm -hmm. So um, we will stop here. We will stop here and pray that God gives us an opportunity to spend time with you again and cover the rest of the topics that we were not able to cover. So thank you so much, and God bless you. I will take parting shots from the panelists, starting with Brenda. Thank you so much. I'd like to encourage our viewers to spend time daily in Scripture as you study, because in so doing, you grow in Christ and you learn anew of Him. The Bible is filled with various gems for you and for me, and God desires that you spend time with him in study so that you may grow in him so that eventually when he comes to take us home, you may be found fit for the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Esther? The, the lesson this quarter was talking to us about the Bible. The center of our, our quarter has just been study of the Bible. There are, might, might be difficult parts in the Bible that you do not understand. It, it is, after all, an inspired word from God. It is not written by human beings. But the basic facts about the Bible are so simple that even a child can understand them. And therefore, I would just urge us, let us read the Bible. The Bible is a story of grace. Grace is everywhere in the Bible. Every personality talked about, you see grace initiated right from Genesis and God coming gloriously in Revelation to take us all home. So the Bible sto story, the fact that a few uh, uh, Bible issues might be difficult is not a hindrance. Let us just read the Bible and the parts that we do not understand maybe is because we have not practiced the ones that we already no, and Thank understand. You. Thank you, Esther. We shall close by a word of prayer from yes, Jack. Let's believe and pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for being with us throughout the last quarter. As we begin the new session to learn about how to make friends for you and your kingdom, we ask that your Holy Spirit will continue abiding with us. And even as we prepare to come back for our next session to complete this review, we ask that you be with us and you guide us. Bless the viewer at home. Meet them at their points of need and prepare us for your second coming at all times. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen.